Hi, I'm Neil Super, Executive Editor for History and American Studies at UC Press. And I'm here with George Sanchez, who is Professor of American Studies and Ethnicity and History at the University of Southern California. He's also the 2020-2021 President of the Organization for American Historians. Welcome, George. Thank you, uh, Neil. Today, <laughs> today we're discussing George's new book, Oil Heights, How a Los Angeles Neighborhood Became the Future of American Democracy, which is hot off the press. Um, this is the radical history of a dynamic multiracial American neighborhood. Sanchez takes us uh, through countless people-centered stories from the earliest period of European settlement through the era of, era of industrialization, mass immigration and class formation, to the post-World War II years of changing migration, white flights, civil rights, post-civil rights politics. Through all this, the book shows the twists and turns that made Boyle Heights extraordinary multiracial diversity possible, a place that Yiddish-speaking Jewish immigrants, the Italian working class, Japanese, Southern Blacks, Ameri Mexican Americans, and more all called home together. The place was not immune to the forces of American apartheid, the book covers the deportation of Mexican Americans during the Great Depression, incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II, hunt for hidden communists amongst the Jewish population and urban renewal projects in the post-war period, the impacts of incarceration on remaining members of the community, the impact of the Chicano movement on the high school students who ignited the school walkouts. But through each period and every struggle, the residents of Boyle Heights maintained remarkable solidarity across racial and ethnic lines, acting as a unified community, even as their tribulations became explicitly more racial in nature. Boyle Heights could serve as the true beacon on a hill towards which the country can strive in a time when racial solidarity and civic resistance have never been in greater need. So George, before I start, I'm gonna surprise you with a photograph that you've never seen this is a bunch of us at the publication party for becoming Mex your first book, <laughs> Becoming Mexican American at Shame and Drum in Ann Arbor. What's amazing, clearly, is that neither of us have changed at all since then. <laughs> um, <laughs> that book is, was, is obviously a landmark in Mexican American history and ethnic studies, and you've obviously been an, an enormously influential builder of those fields then and since then. But it seems that throughout all you've been working on this new book, Boyle Heights, um, you've scoured every possible archive, oral interview, policy paper, data point, religious and cultural source, organizational paper, and much, much more on Boyle Heights. You were born uh, in Boyle Heights to immigrant parents from Mexico. How did your own story motivate you to write the book? Um. I've always thought of Boyle Heights as my home. It's my birthplace. It's, it's uh, where I spent the first five years of my life. Um, and I think one of the things that, that influenced me a, quite a, a great deal is I wanted to understand why my parents chose that particular neighborhood to first settle in. Um, they came from Mexico uh, you know, after a short period with relatives. They then had to find a place to live. And they chose to rent in, in Boyle Heights. And so um, this is the late 50s. And I was very interested in, in what brought them there. But uh, doing just a little bit of research on Boyle Heights, I realized very quickly that that had been similar stories to generations of immigrants uh, from all over, not only this country, but all over the world. And so that, that put in my mind, a kind of greater story on the history of Boyle Heights is as a welcoming place for newcomers, both to Los Angeles, but also often uh, to the United States. So I wanted to understand why that had been and how ha that had kept up for such a long period during the 20th and 21st centuries. Um, so, so in the book, you argue that Boyle Heights offers a model for what US democracy could look like. Um, we, we, you know, that's the subtitle of the book. To me, one of the most poignant sentences in the whole book is, is when you say, when I think of the future of the U.S. and the history that matters in this country, I think of Boyle Heights. Um, so what do you mean by that? And, and what does the book sort of tell us about that? Well, very simply, um, I think the past year or so has given us a window into how difficult 
it is and it will be to create the kind of multiracial democracy that we hope the United States can become as its demographics rapidly change uh, as a whole. Uh, the more I, I researched, the more I wrote about Boyle Heights, I realized that Boyle Heights has been doing this uh, since the early 20th century, when it, it was clear that it was going to not be one of the elite suburban areas of Los Angeles, but in fact, be a, a home for so many different groups. People had to learn how to live together. They had to learn how to go to school together. They had to learn how to work together. Uh, no, whether they came from Japan, Mexico, Eastern Europe, uh, the American South, wherever they came from, they had to learn this. And uh, for most of that time, and for most people, I think it was a community that worked. Uh, people got along, they, they crossed lines with neighbors, they, um, and, and they began to, in fact, protect their neighborhood. They began to take uh, uh, real value in the kind of neighborhood they became. And they, in fact, saw themselves in some ways as more American than anyone else, because they were living on a kind of an American dream of a multiracial democracy long before other parts of the United States thought that they were even close to that. So for me, it's the fact that they created organizations and collective um, uh, bodies to try to really make the community work, even though it was poor, even though it was um, a working class neighborhood. They had to make the community work and had to deal with all the external influences of white supremacy, of apartheid, that were, uh, you know, making it more difficult for a lot of people, whether it be Mexican Americans who were repatriated, Japanese who were interned, uh, Jews that had to fight uh, incredible anti Semitism and the rise of Nazism in Los Angeles. All those groups had to learn to work together. So for me, it's a symbol of the multiracial democracy, which is possible. The last part of that is that, you know, we have 11 million undocumented people living in the United States. And Boyle Heights, in fact, has messages for, for how to incorporate those people into uh, American communities. And I think uh, the Mothers of East LA, uh, Homeboy Industries do a wonderful job of thinking through what are the implications of incorporating those individuals into the very fabric of a community, even when they they are legally not supposed to be there, as May Nye says, impossible subjects. Um, and I and Boyle Heights continues to give those kinds of messages to a wider American public uh, that I think is very very critical. One of the one of the things that you 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 talk about contributing to solidarity in Boyle Heights, um, and I was thinking about this when you're talking about people there thinking of themselves as more American than, than anyone. Um, but it's also the radical visions and traditions of political organizing that immigrants brought from overseas um, to Boyle Heights. Um, Matt Jacobson on the cover of the book calls the book intensely local and satisfyingly global. And I think, you know, I, I think the book, it, it, Boyle Heights is a model for that type of history. Um, how, how, can you explain how more a bit on, on how the book is both global and local? I think it's very important uh, for Americans to know that immigrants to this country are not, don't come as clean slates. They come with histories, they come with um, politics, they come with a sense of where they are in the world. And so a lot of what I document early in the book is the, the ways in which um, what was happening fundamentally in the transformation to industrial society in Japan or Eastern Europe uh, or Mexico, or uh, in the American South, what uh, really shaped the ideologies that the immigrants brought and the migrants brought to Boyle Heights. When they came to Boyle Heights, they were coming to a city of Los Angeles that was very anti-union, uh, open shop, uh, very much antagonistic to the kind of organizing that many, many of these migrants thought is very common to protect their interests. And so uh, I play out what it meant to kind of grow up in that neighborhood and, and really form a different kind of politics. Um, you clearly saw that as people rallied around uh, the United States in, under World War II, even as Japanese were, were, were interned. And then in the post-war era, as the rest of Los Angeles turns decidedly to the right 
and towards a kind of anti-communist ideology, people in Boyle Heights see themselves as a, a kind of refuge for people who are farther left um, and who really need to organize to protect their own interests and to protect the neighborhood. Um, and so I was very interested in how this evolved in Boyle Heights, how um, the community service organization, for example, that elected Edward Roybal in 1949 to the city council, uh, how they exemplified kind of that attitude that, uh, wait a second, you know, we are being treated as foreigners, but in fact, we are growing up in an, in an area that is, that is classically uh, American. Um, and so it's, it's, it's not that they were defenseless, it's that actually they, they saw in their own histories a kind of um, American story that they wanted to enact and improve on in Boyle Heights. And so for, for me, it's taken into account both the American condition, but also the ideologies and the, the way of looking at the world that, that immigrants and migrants bring with them from other places. That, and that combination really gives power to what happens in Boyle Heights. To me, that, this, that begs the question, um, you know, obviously Boyle Heights is, is unique in, in, in many ways, and you show how this happens time and time again. Um, but, uh, and it challenges sort of what we think about um, urban ethnic history more broadly, which is usually the sort of ethnic succession model. Um, uh, or, or focuses on, on, on individual ethnic groups. Um, um, and, and this story just sort of explodes, explodes all of that. But, but um, while, while Boyle Heights is, is unique, does it also, does this book also sort of show us ways, do you think that we can sort of um, see cracks in the ethnic succession model in other cities? And, or, or you know, encourage us to sort of focus on multiple groups you know, again and again in other places as well. And sort of a subset of that question is, you know, what do we learn from looking at American history from a Western urban place like Boyle Heights um, more broadly? And, you know, is your book in, in, in some ways an alternative American history? So, you know, I think it's really important that for all the uniqueness of Boyle Heights, there are so many cities uh, in this country, so many areas that uh, have had significant multiracial communities sort of embody them at different times. And whether we're talking about Brooklyn, whether we're talking about Chicago, uh, whatever city it is, these have been very significant in US history. I think the difference has been that many of us, uh, including myself, were trained by looking at a single racial ethnic group and trying to trace its history. And uh, by doing that, we actually uh, enable kind of a, a history which tells the story of, of urban America as a story of ghettos, a story of barrios that seem to be single ethnic, single racial groups. But as I was doing this history of, La of East Los Angeles, I sort of realized, wait a second, um, the period that Boyle Heights was multiracial isn't simply a prelude to then it becoming a Mexican-American barrio, which it, which it does uh, by the end of the 20th century. It actually exists in that state for a much longer period of time. And it, it has a long history of this kind of interaction. And I started to see that so many other cities that have been classic stories for kind of a single ghetto or a single barrio, let's take Chicago, for example, in fact, was very uh, multiracial, multiethnic for a very long time. Um, and that's because we didn't take into account and didn't write the history in such a way where the interaction between groups was a centerpiece of, of the urban environment, as opposed to simply looking at the forces of segregation. Um, that has a profound implications in terms of rewriting uh, much of urban history and even some of rural history in, in the United States. Um, you know, uh, Iowa right now is uh, profoundly being transformed by Mexican immigration and the interaction between Mexican uh, immigrants and uh, what we would call the traditional rural white uh, uh, Iowans is profound. Um, and that you get re reproduced in lots of areas. Um, 
you know, I saw it in the 1992 LA riots when South South Los Angeles, that had been a traditionally black community, was clearly now 60% uh, Latino. I see it in in places like Koreatown in Los Angeles, contemporary Koreatown, which is also about 70% Latino residentially. Um, so so you've got all of these places um, that that are multiracial. The problem is we see that as abnormal. We see that as something that is uncommon. And we, we are always either projecting backwards nostalgically to a time in which it was a ghetto or a body of a single ethnic group or forward to a time well it will become that. And thinking that's the norm when in reality it isn't. And I just think we need more historical analyses of, of these locations that take into account the, the back and forth between all kinds of different people uh, that have always moved through cities. And, um, you know, the, 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 that history is actually a lot richer than we've given it credit for. So that's really one of the, the fundamental things that drove me to tell this history in the way that I tell it. Um, that does come from the West. Uh, that certainly comes from a, a notion of the kind of power of multiracial communities in the West. But I think it equally applies to the East. It's just we have tended to, to see um, immigration in the East as a wave of subsequent generations of immigrants from different places, instead of actually realizing the, the levels of interaction that have happened in any of those places um, in any given community over time. And so I think that, that this is something that Western history, history coming from California, can, how it can inform the histories that we need to tell about Boston or Philadelphia or New York or, or Washington, DC in a, in a different light. Um, uh, and I think that will help us open up uh, some of the possibilities for understanding US society very differently as we head overall to a much more multiracial uh, country. Yeah, that's great. I, I you know, you talk, you just talked about Io and now, and you, you know, earlier you talked about um, um, what Boyle Heights can teach us about sort of uh, uh, undocumented uh, residents being part of the community and part of the politics and part of change. Um, um, and uh, so the book, I mean, the book is a history. Boyle Heights is a history. But but it, it it keeps the present in mind and it, it goes right up to the present and you don't you you do exactly what you sort of you know said you just said you do now you don't you don't sort of the book doesn't have a kind of nostalgia for a bygone era of multiculturalism or, or you know or utopia um, you you bring it up to the present and it's and the bits on the present are just as revelatory as as the past. Um, how, you know, beyond, beyond what you've already talked about, how does your book speak to the present um, issues of things like gentrification, you know, the division, obviously, as you said at the beginning of this, this kind of question and answer uh, about the divisions we're facing in the year, this year, between surging white nationalism on the one hand and uh, calls for racial justice on the other. Um, what, what, what about now can readers take away from the book? And you've already touched on some of it. Yeah, no, I think that, um the power of gentrification is kind of clearly uh, putting Boral Heights and other urban neighborhoods at risk. And it's not a question of losing something that, that it once had, and, and, but it's really a question of can we live uh, in urban neighborhoods uh, across social classes? Um, or are our urban areas always going to be dominated by those that have the most capital? those that are, that are rich. And, and in Boyle Heights, what's interesting is, is that at least to the moment, it's had a uh, politics which has kept um, immigrant and working class people there, even as uh, forces of gentrification have completely re uh, refashioned other neighborhoods in central Los Angeles. So I'm interested in, in, in how Boyle Heights history informs that politics of gentrification. I'm also interested in the fact that it looks like if there isn't any form of gentrification going on in Boyle Heights, it's more gentrification, or it's um, college educated Latinos, sometimes from the same neighborhood, moving back into that urban space and sometimes pricing out uh, more low income uh, immigrant uh, uh, folks, i.e. children going to college, forcing out their own parents. 
from living in that neighborhood. That's a kind of urban issue that I think we have to deal with very uh, upfront in the present, right? We want to have uh, people who get higher educations, higher income, stay and contribute to, to neighborhoods and communities without totally destroying what that neighborhood, uh, what makes it attractive in the first place, what makes it connected across generations. And that's a real challenge for urban neighborhoods. And I think Boyle Heights is going to be having to work on that challenge as we sort of move forward in time. I don't know what, what's going to happen in the future, but I do think that its, it's, it's own past is going to inform that future. People are going to want to keep the aspects of Boyle Heights, which have been uh, important and critical in, in overcoming other obstacles as it confronts the issues of gentrification, which every urban area is going through right now. We're running up against time, but this is this is fantastic. And you know, all of these issues should make everybody want to go and buy the book. You can order Boyle Heights wherever books are sold, including bookshop.org or a local independent bookstore. Um, and George, thank you very much for joining us. Absolutely, my pleasure.